tax evade tax in india over the years thanks to the high taxation of the 80s and 70s and i blame only that for that remember we had a time when the marginal rate of tax was 97.5% <laughs> <laughs> 97.75%. And if you added wealth tax, it crossed the 100%. <laughs> that, that drove the people of India into a culture of tax evasion. Today, an income tax rate is considered a status symbol. <laughs> Nobody is too bothered about it. That means he has been very clever all these years. He stumbled now. That will change. It will change only over a period of time. If tax evasion comes down, tax collection will go up. I don't think the tax numbers will dramatically increase. not new taxes. One was a cash transaction tax, banking cash transaction tax. Why was it done? It was done to track large cash deposit and large cash withdrawals because we had no other mechanism to track it. Once we put in place an alternative mechanism, I removed that tax. Once I put in place the FIU, once I put in place third party reporting, and once I put in place suspicious transaction reporting by banks, I've removed that tax. So while you correctly said I introduced the tax, I wish you had also said I've removed the tax. <laughs> fringe benefit tax. You know better than I do. Fringe benefit tax was always there in Income Tax Act. It was always there. It was tax on perquisites. The tax on perquisites was scattered in several sections. We grouped them together and called them fringe benefit tax. If I had simply left it alone, you would still have to pay perquisite tax. Number three, STT. If it is such a bad tax, why have you not abolished it? STT was a good tax because, again, it tracked every transaction in the capital market. And the SATA market was practically wiped out only because of STT. The Dabba market, what do you call that? <laughs> Dabba or SATA? Dabba, Dabba market was practically wiped out only because of STT. And I think most brokers have told me that they're grateful that the Dabba market was wiped out. And they became honorable businessmen rather than Dabba brokers. <laughs> It shouldn't take place. Somebody should. The capital market regulator should stop that. He has the powers to do that. Uh, sir, uh, we have been told that 51% of the population does have an income of over two and a half lakhs per year. Is this uh, exaggeration? No, that's because that, does, that means that there are 500 million tax evaders in this that's country. Not so, what would be the correct figure according to you, sir? Correct Approximately. I have no approximation. All I know is, all I know is, roughly, thirty crore families are engaged in agriculture or dependent on agriculture. They have no other non-agricultural income. They are completely exempt from taxation. Per capita income of this country is one lakh. So given a family of 
five for a capita income of a family is going to be five lakhs. And you have to keep out agricultural tax. Even if you take the per capita of a family as five, allow for threshold income for two earning members, neither the family is not liable to tax. So I think these numbers of 51% of a taxable income is a gross exaggeration. At best, it can be at best, it can be about 10% of the population. At the moment, it is about for income tax purposes. It's about three, three and a half crore now, 3.7 crore or something. At best, it can go up to 10 crore or maybe 12 crore, but it can't go beyond that at all. Yeah, sir. Uh, actually, it's related to uh, uh, business. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, at Make in India, a lot of discussions uh, happening by the central government. So, how is India positioned against China? And uh, second is uh, talk of the town is deglobalizing. Deglobalizing. <laughs> Uh, what is your advice to the Indian businessman? Uh, Deglobalization has become fashionable after President Trump got elected. <laughs> but even he started moderating his views. You see, globalization has its downsides. Joseph Stiglitz documented the downsides of globalization. But don't forget that it is globalization that brought about widespread prosperity. It's globalization that lifted India. 140 million people were lifted out of poverty between 2004 and 14. Forget 91 to 2004. In fact, it's amazing. Look at the complete turn of the wheel. The president of America, who's now a champion of a closed economy, and the president of China goes to Davos and speaks for globalization. Complete full circle. The way to grow the world's economy is to trade more. <laughs> Movement of goods and services must become freer. Movement of persons must become freer. All barriers must come to an end. That's the way to grow the world's economy. But since we live on one planet, but we regard ourselves as nation states and we look upon ourselves as upholders of the nation's interest. Although we occupy one planet, we are divided into 186 units. Therefore, from time to time, you will have these protectionist tendencies showing up their head. But eventually, the American people will realize if they stop the import of cars, motor cars will become costlier in America. If they stop the import of shoes, shoes will become more expensive in America. If they stop the import of clothes, clothes will become more expensive in America. And then they will say, why have prices gone up suddenly? It's only a non-tradable by a McDonald's, like a McDonald's hamburger, in which the market is always a protected market because it's a non-tradable, it is uh, low shelf life. But when it comes to shoes and clothes and cars, it's only because they are tradable that prices have come down. Americans will soon realize that if they want to keep up their standards of living, they'll have to allow foreign goods to come into the country. And they will also realize that if they want some jobs to be done, there are no Americans ready to do the job. <laughs> no American willing to do the job, and in some cases, no American qualified to do the job. They'll have the, the British, um, what is that? Uh, the health system, what is that called? And the national health system will collapse, will collapse if Indian and Pakistani doctors are not there. It will completely collapse overnight. Therefore, I think uh, there's no, no way you can stop globalization. But it will be slowed down for a while until these protectionist tendencies work themselves out. And it will come back. Globalization will again come back and world trade will again take place. So I don't think uh, uh, India should become protectionist. In fact, our pain, our fault was we were protectionist for 40 years. <laughs> and we struggled to dismantle those protections in 1991. Uh, we made a bonfire of the Red Book. 
That was the bane of Indian economy from 47 to 91. Imagine as long as you had the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, your foreign exchange reserves went down to, at one point of time, $700 million, 0 0.7 billion. And once you got rid of the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, your foreign exchange reserves are $370 billion. If, uh, if, if I want to say that you are the CEO of the country, side by side. We have many bilateral partnerships. We also have multilateral partnerships. Those are not actually really happening. So we are part of uh, ASEAN Plus. We also have bilateral treaties. We have several bilateral treaties. We also have multilateral treaties. I think it depends on the context and the goods and services we have under discussion. I think uh, bilateral treaties are really building blocks for multilateralism. But if multilateralism itself is weak, the European Union is, say, imploding. I hope not, but if the European Union implodes, you say after Brexit, if you have Brexit, <laughs> and after Brexit, you have Nexit, Netherlands <laughs> goes out, uh, France goes out, then we have to necessarily rely upon bilateral treaties. So we are not complete masters of the situation. It also depends upon our trading partners. But take ASEAN. ASEAN is a very cohesive, very powerful group. Despite what's happening in Europe, ASEAN is holding very strong. Therefore, we have to lead with ASEAN. When we lead with ASEAN, we'll have to have multilateralism. When we lead with Europe, we may have to resort to bilateralism. So you mentioned about uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, blockade. Like you know, you know, two issues. One is RBA's 1934 uh, Act, which uh, especially uh, the Section 26.2 as well as 24.1, which say that you know, uh, the currency 2000 is not at all you know uh, legal. Is it a fact or is it a? No, that's not the, the currency is legal. RBI can recommend the denomination and the amount of currency to be printed. Once the government approves it, then the RBI will print the currency. Here, the RBI did recommend the 2,000 rupee note, and government approved it. It's a different matter whether it was a wise recommendation, but it's certainly legal. Second question is about Ganga, because, you know, the Germans cleaned the Rhine River in 30 years. Uh, we, the, we, if you recall, you know, Rajiv Gandhi was the first prime minister to sanction 100 crores for cleaning Ganga. Cleaning Ganga was because basically because uh, the, uh, the entire UP, I mean, the border, they would burn the dead body half and throw it to Britain. So the crocodiles were gone. But now today, I mean, the British government is saying 20,000 crore rupees. See, as I said, that's a failure of our administrative machinery, our incapacity to deliver on a promise. I can give any number of examples. We simply do not have a bureaucracy that has the capacity to deliver. And Ganga cleaning is one classic example. We had a fine administrator, Seshan, but he couldn't do it. Therefore, the structure of our bureaucracy is such that it does not, is not able to deliver. Just read the CNAG's report, which was published yesterday, presented yesterday to Parliament, on the defense ministry. Example after example, of how funds allocated border roads. Why can China build border roads if we cannot build the border roads on this side? Our missionary to build the border roads is so weak and so ineffective. I can give any number of examples. Therefore, we have to deconstruct and reconstruct our administrative missionary. We cannot continue to have this legacy bureaucracy 
which we got from the British, we have to deconstruct it first and reconstruct it in order to deliver the things that we want to deliver. Two last questions. So, what is your idea of uh, recapitalization of the PHU plan? So, uh, so why how will they lend? Uh, so, you know, right now they are not lending to the infrastructure and other activities. So, if uh, because of the NPS or the problem, so if you, uh, what is your idea of the recapitalization of the Indian plan so they can again restart, refinance? Banking is a peculiar business. You can grow only if you have more capital. As you lend more, you need more capital because it is requirement of uh, CRAR, capital reserve adequacy and efficiency ratio. Those are all uh, statutory uh, stipulations, uh, parcel norms. Unless you have so much capital, you can't lend. So once you reach the limit of your lending capacity, if you want to lend more, you must have more capital. Now where can capital come from? Capital can come, one, from profits. Retained earnings, number one. Number two, capital can come if the existing shareholders put more money. Number three, capital can come if you allow new shareholders to come in and dilute the shareholding of existing shareholders. There's no other way for capital to come. Therefore, if the government wants to retain majority ownership, it must put in more money. Or it must allow more other people to put in money and dilute its ownership or banks must make enough profits to retain the capital. So there's no other way. There's only one of three ways, and the capitalization is absolutely necessary. Which way you take, or which combination of ways you take, is a matter of judgment for the government. Hey, sir, sir, just one No, I, I, sorry. Just a uh, word of thanks, sir, very quickly. I'm sorry about that. If you can give it a try in the balance question, we'd be happy to run it through. Thank you. Of our members are SMEs. As you very rightly pointed out, 
the growth of jobs does not come from large enterprises, it comes from the SME sector, the Silicon Valley sector. In fact, there are studies so at Harvard and MIT which show that large enterprises destroy jobs, the negative growth of jobs. So therefore, it's very important to create a culture where we encourage SMEs and encourage entrepreneurs from that sector. I was staggered to hear of the IIT director, Bombay director, that 25% of the graduates from IIT Bombay become entrepreneurs. Stanford is famous for that. So is MIT famous for that. We create entrepreneurs who in turn create jobs. Sir, it's business that creates jobs. One staggering statistic which hit me like a ton of bricks that we have been 45 Harsatnas in India. Only one of them went to a businessman. It's a very staggering statistic that shows the importance we give to the businessman who creates the jobs. So I think some of you to, to correct this. One final request, sir. Come again. We want to hear you. We want you to create those ideas and tell all of us what we should do going forward. Because India needs a bright future. And there is no reason why we cannot become another China.